Good morning, Gardens. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Jesus who fills this sanctuary with His presence through the power of the Holy Spirit. This room is filled with the live and dynamic presence of Christ from the floor to the ceiling, from the walls, from end to end. This place is filled with Christ. Thanks be to God. It is the Spirit of Christ that calls us to worship this morning, so would you join with me in the call to worship that you'll see in your bulletins and on the screens. The Lord be with you. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. Amen, and thanks be to God. It's great to see everyone this morning. I want to extend a welcome to everyone, friends and guests and members and visitors alike. We are blessed to be together. We are blessed to have you with us. I want to remind everyone to uh, use those friendship pads on the ends of the aisles to note your presence and any relevant information that you feel like we need to know. And also just wanted to ask you and invite you to take a look at the bulletin so you're aware of the various happenings going on over the course of this week in, uh, through the life of our congregation and our church. Those are really the only announcements that I have for you this morning, so I would invite you now to stand and to greet one another, to welcome each other, to worship and extend the peace of Christ. To- Yes, Jesus loves me. I love that you play that. <laughs> Bam. The first scripture this lesson this, the first scripture this morning is a lesson from the prophet Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the first eight verses. So you can follow in your bulletin, you can follow on the screen, or just listen now for the word of God to you this morning. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne, the edges of his robe filling the temple. Winged creatures were stationed around him. Each had six wings. With two, they veiled their faces. With two, their feet. And with two, they flew about. They shouted to each other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heavenly forces. All the earth is filled with God's glory. The door frame shook at the sound of their shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. I said, Mourn for me, I am ruined. I'm a man with unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. Yet I've seen the King, the Lord of heavenly forces. Then one of the winged creatures flew to me, holding a glowing coal that he'd taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed, and your sin is removed. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? I said, I'm here. Send me. Our second scripture lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Uh, It's a passage of scripture that is probably somewhat familiar to you, especially if you have been uh, following Christ or attending church for any number of years. It's a passage in the Gospel of Luke in which Jesus calls his first disciples. And so what I'm going to invite you to do is to not read it this morning. To not read it on the screens, not read it in your bulletins. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask us together to practice a form of reading the scriptures that's called Lectio Divina. When we come to the scriptures, there's a lot of different ways that we can kind of explore them. We can study them, which is what we Presbyterians seem to prefer to do best, right? Underline and take notes and kind of dissect them as kind of the scholars that our tradition has seemed to affirm and to build. We can try to apply them, take these scriptures and ask ourselves the question, what does this have to do with me? Or how does this apply to my life? Well, Lectio Divina invites us to experience the scriptures differently. 
Instead of studying them, instead of even necessarily trying to apply them, although those certainly will come, the invitation from Lectio Divina is to enter into the story, to experience it, to step into the scriptures as if you were there. So we're about to read a passage of scripture where you will be standing on the seashore, the lakeside of the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret, which was Luke's preferred term for the Sea of Galilee. What does it feel like? Is there a breeze blowing? Is it humid? Do you hear seagulls or birds? What does it smell like? Do you smell the fish that the fishermen are cleaning? What does it sound like for there to be that low, dull rumble of the crowd in the background? And what did Jesus' feet sound like as they crunch on the sand? What does the boat sound like as it is pushed off and launched into the water as those small waves and that wake ripples and gently touches the shore? Enter into this passage. Close your eyes. Who are you? Where are you in that? Let's go to God in this word. Hear now the word of the Lord. One day, Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret when the crowd pressed in around him to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, and then asked him to row out a little distance from the shore. Jesus sat down in the boat and taught the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Simon, row out farther into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, We've worked hard all night and have caught nothing. But because you say so, I'll drop the nets. So they dropped the nets, and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. They signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled both boats so full that they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinner. Peter and those with him were overcome with amazement because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners. And they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to the shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, in this time, we consent to your divine presence and action within our lives as we meet with you. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. So this morning we are with Jesus at the lake shore. With Jesus, just like Peter was with Jesus. Just like that crowd was with Jesus. It's a nice little reprieve much more of a pastoral setting than where we were last week when we were with Jesus in the synagogue in, in Nazareth, right? Especially where that we saw Jesus experiencing kind of that sense of rejection. That says, is that somebody's phone or is that an alarm? I just want to, I want to get clar clarity on that. Is that a, a medical alert? We're okay. Just a phone. All right. I normal I can preach over phones, but I just wanted to make sure that we weren't having a medical emergency there. So, so last week we were with Jesus in that synagogue in Jerusalem, right? As that crowd, as their anger and their tension began to build, as they became so angry with Jesus's missional understanding. And they tried to kill him. But it wasn't Jesus' time yet. And a few weeks before that, we were with Jesus at the wedding in Cana. As we read in the Gospel of John and saw how Jesus then miraculously turned that water into wine, reminding his disciples, in some ways, using that sign, that miracle, as a way to jump up and down to scream to get his disciples' attention that he was the light of the world who would bring illumination and life and light so that they might understand that they were God's beloved. We are with Jesus, just as those disciples were with Jesus. And we stand at that lakeshore this morning. And there was Peter, cleaning his nets with his brother Andrew, although Luke doesn't bother to mention him in this particular passage, and their partners, James and John, and their small business operation of Sea of Galilee fishermen. And they had just experienced a rather disappointing and dejecting evening where they have caught not just a few fish, not just an underwhelming catch, but nothing. Which, maybe they're not such good businessmen, right? Or their fishing is about as good as mine. Because every time I seem to go to catch fish, I end up just donating shrimp to the crabs in the ocean. But these disciples, this is their gig, this is what they do. They've had good days, they've had bad days, and this is one of the bad days. One of those evenings where they have seemingly wasted their time. They're frustrated, they're exhausted, and they're worn out. And here comes Jesus with his little crowd of followers who seem to follow him everywhere he's going here in Capernaum. And again, that's where we are right now. And that's where the rest of the Gospel of Luke here in chapter 5, really essentially through chapter 14 or 15, when Jesus and his disciples begin to kind of journey and pilgrimage down from Capernaum to Jerusalem, this first half of the Gospel of Luke will happen in this region of Capernaum, in the northern regions of Galilee. And where Jesus finds and calls his first disciples, where people are where they find the message that Jesus proclaims about the good news of God, why they are open and they are receptive to that. And so Jesus and his crowd, they come to this lake shore. 
Jesus has been hanging out in Capernaum for a while now. One thing that's unique in the Gospel of Luke, especially in comparison to, say, the Gospel of Matthew or Mark, is it turns out, though, as the way that these Gospels tell Jesus is the story of Jesus calling his disciples, is that Jesus has been doing ministry. Jesus has been teaching. Jesus has been doing a little bit of a solo act. He has been healing people with illnesses. He has been casting out demons since he has, was rejected in that Nazareth synagogue and prior to his calling of the disciples. So he has been at work. And the people of Capernaum, including Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John, they would have heard of Jesus. They would have, their, Jesus would have caught their attention. And actually in the story pre, that immediately precedes our passage of scripture for this morning, we learn that one day after Jesus was preaching and teaching and healing, Jesus went to Simon's home and was his guest there. And as his guest, he comes and he sees that Simon's mother-in-law is ill. And so Jesus actually heals Simon's mother-in-law. So Simon who will soon be named Peter, has already seen and witnessed and experienced Jesus' power firsthand. And so maybe that's why he's willing to listen to Jesus, even though he's fatigued and exhausted and possibly a little bit skeptical. When Jesus shows up at that lake shore, and asks to borrow his boat. At first, it's just a simple request. Hey, Simon, I see you're not using your boat anymore. How'd that go for you last night? Not so well, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Do you mind if I get in this boat so I can create a little bit of better stage or kind of create a little bit of better sight line so I'm not crowded by all these people? I don't even have elbow room. I'm trying to talk, but everybody's all around me. So if you let me borrow your boat, I'm just going to shove off a few feet. We can drop anchor there. I'm not going to be doing any dynamic preaching because I'm going to be sitting in this boat. So the boat's not going to be rocking. We're just going to kind of, let me just tell the crowd about the kingdom of God. Let me just use this opportunity to remind them that they are God's beloved and to invite them into this thing that God would desire for them. This life of repentance to experience the presence of the kingdom and the reign of God. So Peter, let's just, let's just push off a few feet. And Peter takes a break from that important work of cleaning that fishing net. Because as every good fisherman knows, and even the bad fishermen know, like I'm a bad fisherman, and I at least know this, is anytime you're done fishing, you got to clean your gear if you want to be able to use it in the future. So this cleaning of the nets, this kind of unknotting of the nets, this was an important part of the day, and not something that the disciples with Simon and his brothers and his fishing partners would, unless they finished that task, they wouldn't have been able to go home. So this is kind of a bit of an annoyance. It's a bit of a delay. Jesus is interrupting their life right now. Jesus is interrupting their routine. And yet, they acquiesce and they push off. And Jesus says what he has to say. But Luke doesn't really tell us the specifics, does he? What's important to Luke is not the content of Jesus' message as much as what is about to happen now. Because now he turns to Simon in this boat and says, okay, well, let's raise the anchor and, and now let's push out into the deeper waters. And when we're out there, then drop your net and let's see if we can catch any fish. Now Peter's patience is seriously, seriously tried. Now his crabbiness and his crankiness is probably starting to come through a little bit, right? Sun is up, it's getting hot. He's tired. He knows the fish are not biting. 
and this will most likely be a waste of his time. He's skeptical about these words of Jesus. How can Jesus' words have any impact in the reality that I know to be true in this day? Peter must be thinking. So he says to Jesus, Master, other translations translated as or Lord. And this is not necessarily a confession of faith. That will come later from Peter. Jesus is not saying, you are the Christ. He's simply being polite. In this instance, it's almost as if Peter is saying, sir, or teacher, which would be something very common and a way of, a common way of addressing kind of a, a rabbi or a teacher of the faith. Okay, sir, listen. I mean, I get it. You want me to go out? We've, we've done this all night. We know there's no fish. We've been doing this for a long time, Jesus. We're tired. Surely, you've got better things to do than make us do this. But, what does he say next? He says, but because you say so, I'll drop the nets. Somewhere underneath that fatigue, somewhere underneath that exhaustion, somewhere underneath that skepticism, somewhere underneath the absence of wonder that is currently manifesting in Simon Peter's life, there is that Tinge of hope. We're tired, Jesus. We know there's no fish. But what if? What if? What if the same Jesus who I just saw with my own eyes heal my mother-in-law has something up his sleeve? What if this same Jesus who has already manifested his power and the love of God by healing people and, and casting out demons in our community. What if? And so despite himself, Peter practices a tepid obedience and drops the nets. And the rest, as they say, is history the nets are full. They are bursting. Luke is trying to convey a sense that God's provision is so abundant that it cannot be contained. Not by any net because those are bursting. Not by any one boat because if you were to try to haul this, this net full of fish onto one boat, it would sink. It requires two boats and four people and then those two boats that are required those are riding dangerously low in the water there is ridiculous abundance so much so that Peter and his disciples who have been lack of coffee groggy after staying up all night who have been skeptical who have been exhausted who do not want to be there now all of a sudden the scriptures tell us they are amazed. What is going on here? And their amazement, Peter's amazement, leads him to a spiritual awakening. He realizes that he is standing in the presence of someone who is holy. Someone who has power that he has not seen before. And someone who is ushering him and introducing him, inviting him into an experience, the experience of the presence of God in a way that he has never experienced before. And when he encounters that holiness, when he encounters that sacredness, when the hairs on the back of his neck are standing up because of the spiritual power of that moment, he falls at Jesus his feet and begs for, for forgiveness, confesses 
his brokenness. Jesus grabs him by the hand, invites him up. And invites him to see his fear transformed into, of all things, partnership in the kingdom of God. And so these two boats riding dangerously low in the water with nets that are splitting, as they kind of are splitting so much that even some of the fish that they've already captured are kind of escaping as they're trying to drag it back to the shore. As they spend all that time getting their boats back, hauling these nets with, with, that are splitting with fish back onto shore, the thing that they wanted to do earlier that day, the thing that they set out to do just hours before, to feed themselves, to feed their family, to fund their business. This great, ridiculous abundance, this manifestation of the miraculous powers of Jesus. What do they do? <laughs> they leave it all behind. They do not take even a single fish home. They don't clean a single fish. They don't take a single fish to the market. They don't open their nets. They don't clean their nets. They don't untangle their nets. They don't hose their nets down. They don't worry about their boats because the scriptures tell us they leave everything, everything. They experience total, total surrender, total relinquishment, and total abandonment. Everything in their life prior to meeting Jesus now pales in comparison. All of their hope, everything that gave them a sense of worth or purpose or accomplishment, anything that was their everything is now nothing and it has been replaced by Jesus and the only thing that these disciples want and will ever want is to follow Him. Jesus's Abundance transformed into radical invitation to relationship and partnership. And just as Jesus met the disciples on a lake shore, Jesus meets us in those same and similar ways. And there are a few things to highlight as we reflect on what it looks like when Jesus calls to us. The first, and perhaps the most significant, is that the disciples were not doing anything that was overtly holy or religious, right? They were doing the thing that they would be doing every day of their life. Jesus met the disciples in their everydayness. Sometimes we think that when we want to have these spiritual encounters with Christ, that we've got to kind of gussy up our lives in some kind of spiritually significant ways. We've got to work on our own sense of holiness or our spiritual practices or at least dim the lights and light a few candles, right? Maybe some incense, put on some like Gregorian chant. I don't know, some hymns. We've got to do something in our life to try to force God to show up in our life, right? I mean, we've got to do something that's going to create an atmosphere in which God is going to want to come and be present and visit us, right? But the one thing that we see in this scripture is that the disciples do nothing. The disciples have to do nothing to entice Christ to come to them, right? It's not like Peter or Simon at this time, as he was referred to, Simon Peter, I'm using those words interchangeably. It's not like Simon Peter is walking around with a great big sign saying, Jesus, I know you're in town. Come and hang out with me, right? I'm interested. I'm open. I'm open. I'd like to find out more about you. It's not like Peter's walking around saying his prayers, right? There's no candles, there's no Gregorian chant, there's no incense. He's just doing his thing. And Jesus just shows up in the middle of it, interrupts. 
And that's the same way for us. What we have to understand is that God in Christ, you don't have to do anything to get God's attention. You don't have to do anything to try to make your life more appropriate for this divine visitation. There's nothing that you have to do and frankly nothing that you can do to invite Christ to come. Because Christ is already coming. Whether you like it or not, whether it's convenient or not, Christ is coming. And Christ will meet you in the most mundane places, at the most boring and inconvenient times. And He will take your breath away and amaze you at the ways His love and His grace and His power would be manifested in your life. And in those moments when Christ breaks through, we are tempted to do the same thing that Peter does, right? What does Peter do? He confesses, which is good. I mean, it's always good to confess our sin, right? But the other thing that Peter is trying to do, and he's been doing it this whole time, is he's been trying to distance himself from Christ. He's been trying to create some room from Christ. He's been trying to create some elbow room, right? He's a kind of a good Midwesterner, so to speak. He doesn't want too many people around him at any one time, and he wants to keep his distance nice, safe, and sound from Jesus, so he does that with some of this, the language that he uses, and he does that with this act of confession. But what Jesus does is he refuses to allow Peter to keep his distance. He refuses to allow Peter to hold him an arm's distance away. And as if Peter is trying to create some space, trying to do the Heisman and stiff arm Jesus, Jesus is trying to collapse that space. And instead of that Heisman arm, Jesus is offering Peter the embrace. And that's the same embrace that Jesus offers to us. When we encounter Christ, it is terrifying. When we encounter Christ, it does not feel safe. When we encounter Christ in the middle of our lives, the one thing that we want to try to do is keep our power, keep our autonomy, and keep our ability to figure out and to decide what it is that we want to do with our lives. Because we, we understand, we notice, we recognize that even in those moments of holiness, the sacredness and the spiritual power, there is so much, it feels threatening. Because what does Jesus ask us to do when he meets with us? He asks us to surrender everything, not just a little. Jesus does not just want a little of you. Jesus wants everything. He's greedy. And he wants everything for two reasons. For you. And he invites you to the same journey of surrender and abandonment, service, and blessing that he invited Peter into. Let's pray. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to the shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand now and join in.